everyone. Uh, my name is Jesse Tufexis. It is my pleasure to welcome you to this very special live episode of Meet the Author, presented by the Association for Canadian Jewish Studies. Several authors are joining us today to discuss their contributions to the new volume, No Better Home, Jews, Canada, and the Sense of Belonging. Uh, so just a quick word about this series, because this isn't a typical uh, conference uh, session. Um, after the unfortunate cancellation of last year's ACJS conference, Richard Menkes and I began developing and running this Meet the Author series. Uh, so far, we've uh, split hosting duties on 10 episodes, uh, along with a broader discussion we ran last summer. Uh, and these are all available on the ACJS Presents uh, YouTube page. Uh, in the conference program that you received uh, when I sent the email from Eventbrite, uh, you'll find a link to purchase this book, No Better Home, uh, from U of T Press, currently at a 25% discount. Uh, so it is now my pleasure to give a proper introduction to our guests. Uh, Norm Raven, or Norman Raven, uh, is a novelist, critic, and professor who teaches in the Department of Religions and Cultures at Concordia in Montreal. Lois Dubin is a professor of religion and a member of the Jewish Studies Program at Smith College in Northampton, Massachusetts. She has published widely on 18th and 19th century Jewish history and thought. Mia Spiro is senior lecturer in modern Jewish culture and Holocaust studies in theology uh, and religious studies at the School of Critical Studies, University of Glasgow in Scotland. Uh, Pierre Ancil is professor of contemporary Canadian history and Canadian Jewish history at the University of Ottawa, where I currently am. And David Kaufman holds the J. Richard Schiff Chair for the study of Canadian Jewry and is an associate professor in the Department of History at York University in Toronto. He's also the editor-in-chief of the ACJS's journal, Canadian Jewish Studies. So welcome everyone, thanks for doing this. Um, yes. Really appreciate having you here. Um, and given the large number of people taking part today, um, I'm serving as the sole interviewer. Normally we have um, uh, uh, an expert in the field who comes in and asks the questions. Uh, we have so many people to interview today, I'll be doing it. I'll be the expert, even though I'm not quite an expert uh, in, in this field, uh, although it's a variety of fields. Um, so in addition to serving as the co-organizer of this series with Richard Menkes of the University of British Columbia, I'm a PhD candidate in the Department of Classics and Religious Studies at the University of Ottawa with a research focus on North American Jewish fiction. Um, I'm also the conference chair of the ACJS, and I'm sure most of us have met uh, via email already. Uh, Richard Menkes and I conceptualized the questions for today's session together, so I'd like to offer my sincerest thanks for him uh, for his collaboration and ongoing collaboration in, uh, in everything that we do together. Um, so we have limited time and lots of interesting questions, so I'll get right to it. Um, I also believe uh, there's another contributor, Morton Weinfeld, in the audience, so I'm going to try to leave a few minutes at the end uh, in case he has uh, further comments. Um, and uh, we'll also have a breakout session um, after this session, so people can continue the discussion. Uh, so I'm going to start with David, if that's all right. Um, David, can you tell me about the logic of the book as a whole? Uh, you are you compiled it. Um, why, for instance, did you feel it was important to include both insiders and outsiders in the field? Uh, or why did you feel it important to include American voices in a book about Canada? Sure, with pleasure. Uh, let me first, though, start by thanking you, Jesse, and you, Richard, for running this Meet the Author series. I think it's a great idea, and thanks for the opportunity to uh, discuss this book today. Uh, so the book has a, a mix of Canadianists uh, and Jewish studies specialists who have special specialties in other areas of modern Jewish studies uh, who have a connection to Canada. Either they lived here or they're Canadian citizens, but haven't published work on Canadian subjects before. And the basic logic here was you know, to expand the conversation, to include more participants in it, uh, to get new perspectives uh, on Canadian Jewish, on kind of questions that are important to ask about Canadian Jewish subjects, uh, new questions that might be generated from you know, new, new participants. So Lois, for example, is an early modernist. I don't know if you call yourself that, okay, let's say that. Uh, Jeff Weidlinger and Kalman Weiser, contributors to the book, are Eastern Europeanists. Uh, Hasia Diner is a U.S. historian. 
so there's a, a mix of, of kind of new voices uh, and of um, you know, important voices of not everybody, but important voices uh, in the conversation, the Canadian Jewish conversation. And there's a mix of uh, personal and academic writing that's in the book. Um, and hopefully at least a little bit of underrepresented fields in the book. So the women's studies giant Judith Baskin, for example, has a contribution and the anthropologist Jack Kugelmas has a contribution as well. Um, so that's a bit about the logic. The idea was to gather uh, familiar voices and tap them with a new question, as well as unfamiliar voices and bring them into the conversation. Great, thank you. Uh, so I have a second question for you. Um, the framing question of the volume is not exactly scholarly, um, no better home. Uh, what do you mean by a better home for Jews? Um, what led to the question? What's your answer? Uh, right. So indeed, it's a little bit of a cheeky hook. Uh, it is not exactly the question. It's kind of a point of departure for the book. Uh, it's not a statement either. You'll notice the title doesn't say no better home exclamation point. Uh, it's, it's not meant to be uh, apologetic and it's not meant to be overly celebratory. Um, but I think the question offers uh, or the book as a whole perhaps offers well, in the introduction, I offer a series of justifications uh, for this you know, decidedly non-academic question and problematic question. That said, I do think it's worth asking for a number of reasons. I mean, first of all, I think it's useful, intellectually useful, and perhaps even morally relevant to ask about appreciation, about the, the nature, how, how much can scholars appreciate? Like, is that part of the job or is it not part of the job at all. The book grew out of uh, sesquicentennial celebrations and took advantage of some funding opportunities that were available to bring people into conversation. And I thought in 2017 uh, that it would be appropriate to do some cerebration along with celebration, uh, but they clearly are part of the same process. And I think that there's a fair thing to do for critics to, um, to be analytic about appreciation. Um, second, there's, there's some, uh, some new comparative axes that are uh, available when you, ask, uh, when you ask better, it's by definition something you need to compare with. So Mort Weinfeld's contribution does a you know, direct comparative uh, assessment in social scientific terms with Canadian Jewish life with that of Jewish life in the UK and France. Uh, but there are also other sorts of comparisons that might grow out of such a question, including what I call a vertical, uh, comparing this home that Jews have made, this place as a home with other places that Jews have made home, uh, and uh, a horizontal comparison, comparing uh, Jewish life in Canada with the experience of other uh, religious or ethnic or racial min minorities in Canada. So th these are generative and I think potentially provocative questions uh, that are kind of baked into a clearly, you know, problem-ridden question if it's meant to be just too, uh, too celebratory. Um, but, you know, ultimately, I think the book is aimed at, you know, it, it's offered so that many voices can meditate on one theme, which is the home part. So less emphasis on the better and more on the home, um, which is something that is elusive, it's emotionally powerful, um, and I think it's a good uh, analytic question. Um, and you know, ultimately, I think Canada, Canadian Jews do have much to be appreciative of, appreciative of, and that our our lot in civil life shouldn't be taken for granted because you know societies can change very quickly and often for the worse, and they are fragile and need our work to be shorn up. So that kind of better appreciative part is also uh, part of the the logic of the book as a whole. Great, thank you. Uh, I'm gonna to turn to Mia now. Um, can you summarize the representations of the arrival in Canada in the memoirs of survivors? Why is that moment uh, especially important for you? Um, that's a great question, Jesse. And actually my fascination with the moments of arrival in these migration stories started not in reading memoirs but actually in conversation with people who were reminiscing about arriving in Canada. 
And, and very often when you read memoirs, it seems like an insignificant moment to many people who arrive in the new country, it doesn't form a big part of these narratives. Um, but that feeling of disorientation that is out of time and out of place uh, can very often overcome a person's memory of that moment. Um, you know, we all experience it even in regular foreign travel experiences. We know that disorienting moment of, of arrival. Um, and it was when I was actually just sitting around a table at a holiday meal with my in-laws on a visit to Montreal, and there's friends had come and sat around and very innocuously talking about someone's um, trip on a cruise ship. And it sort of led into um, people's experiences of coming by boat to Canada as children in the post-Holocaust era. Um, you know, it just, I haven't been on a ship since the one that took me to Canada, one person said, and, and so it went on with reminiscences of those moments of crossing, um, which really could be described as body memory of moments of sensory experience that, that went beyond language. The first taste of a banana, for example, or, or a meal um, that was hosted by a benevolent society or the cold or the heat. And I became interested in how these moments, while they didn't take up much space in these narratives or written memoirs, um, but virtually every migrant had a very particular sensory memory uh, of those moments as children. Um, and in some ways, how they describe them and says so much about not only their own identity formation, but also their attitudes towards making a new life and, and self-construction of that of that new person that they are in Canada. So it's that crossing between past and present that really fascinates me most. Um, in my other work, I work on, on ghosts and hauntings um, in, in Holocaust literature. So it's also that sort of in between out of place, out of time, or even out of language that becomes very key to migration and how that gets translated as a, as a story and transmitted and shared is, is of interest to me and it, and it just stood out so much in these um, memoirs from the Azraeli Foundation that I had worked on so long ago and got a chance actually to look again in, in a different perspective. Ghosts and hauntings are my uh, are two of my favorite topics so I'm looking forward to reading your other work. Uh, my second question for you, um, you discuss quote, uh, the concept of Canada as a geographic place of arrival and as a metaphoric space in the migration journey end quote. And you highlight the strangeness of landing here on Canadian soil. Do you think that there's something, this is a bit maybe speculative, but do you think that there's something unique about the Canadian landscape specifically, or is this a typical reaction in migration stories to other places as well? You know, it, it's a good question, Jesse, and, and in some ways in the, in the rationale of, of such an essay, you have to ask yourself that as well. Um, and of course, I have more experience with Canadian memoirs, but I would hazard a guess that all migration stories have that uh, element of, of estrangement or from that comes from the new cultural experience or there's some kind of, of idea of, of place and space and disorientation. Um, but Canada is also a character uh, in many of these stories. And while I was doing research on, on this essay, I came across a study done, um, I guess about 20 years ago, asking respondents and also grade three children, <laughs> what is Canadian about Canadian children's literature? Um, and it's very similar, I, I suppose that you can ask about it, about other Canadian literature too. But it was interesting that over three quarters of the respondents who answered that question mentioned geographical aspects that were particularly Canadian, landscapes, um, you know, location of the settings, regions or communities um, as, a, as a characteristic that makes something particularly Canadian or a certain regionalism 
So in some ways you could say the same thing about these memoirs. Um, you know, there's a long history in Canadian literature about reading into space and landscapes uh, of Canadian literature, where in the ways that these authors depict space can perhaps mirror spiritual concerns or, or other kinds of psychological concerns. You know, we have examples of, you know, the going wild or native and the northern exploration, like a Margaret Atwood kind of thing, or the oppressiveness of poverty and dirt and in urban narratives. Uh, and it's all of these things that we can recognize in Canadian literature more generally. But we have to remember that there's a, aside from a mythic image of Canada as vast and far and wide, um, you know, of the true North, strong and free. Um, but in these memoirs, it's not just about Canadian space or landscape. It is Canadian space and landscape from a European point of view and through European eyes, and also very often through a child's eye. Um, so the way these authors view, whether it's wilderness and landscape through train windows on their way to the urban centers, um, you know, might be their first encounter with a new and strange chapter in life that's reflected in that very Canadian vastness. Um, and sometimes only until they find another group of immigrants that can provide a feeling from home those geographical aspects of Canada um, that are depicted reflect that longing and loneliness um, and displacement. So, you know, Canada has historically been depicted with these literary characteristics uh, of inhospitable wilderness or awesome allure. And there have been reactions to that as well from minority writing and, and but it has that narrative in mind, um, even when it's resisting that narrative. Um, and for these authors, Canada mirrors these very great cultural and social divides that they have to confront. Um, you know, I, I wouldn't say they have to overcome them because I don't think that's, that that's part of the narrative really, it's to live with those struggles. Um, and is this different than other places? Well, I don't know, yes and no. Memoirs um, from Scotland where I live uh, now and, and I'm just starting to look at, or even more generally in the UK have a very different set of concerns um, with history, with national character, with ideas of uh, of the concept of Englishness or Scottishness. So perhaps there are some differences, yes. Great, thank you so much. That was really fascinating. Uh, Norm, I'll turn to you now. Um, so my first question for you, after exploring several images and stories, especially that of your own family, you summarize the past relationship between Jews and the mainstream and a recent snafu at the opening of the Holocaust Memorial in Ottawa as a quote, dance of mystery and apprehension. Could you elaborate on that mystery, that apprehension? Thanks, Jesse. I'll just say first, I got some jazz ghosts in the backyard and I don't know if they're emanating, but uh, may maybe things are okay. I, I asked them to go away. Um, so Jesse knows uh, a couple of things that we've worked on together and he picks up this phrase uh, that's a nice challenge, the idea of the relationship between uh, Canadian Jews and the Jewish mainstream as a kind of a, as he, as he catches me saying, a dance of mystery and misapprehension. I've been reasserting that idea in different places. So my essay in David's collection derives from specific research though for a memoir that I've been working on um, that's focused on the very early 30s. So the years prior to the Nun is Too Many narrative and I would say little known years in, in many ways. And it's the story of my maternal grandfather's departure from Poland in 1930, then his time as a rabbi and a teacher and a ritual slaughterer, uh, almost all the time in mid and southern Saskatchewan. Um, and then his, unye his unyielding efforts to bring his immediate family after him uh, to Canada, of course, in times when that was next to impossible. So my early 30s Canada is a specific one. It's uh, governed by conservatives, not liberals. Uh, 
so R.B. Bennett. Um, and my grandfather's leaving time from Poland is specific and, and particular too. That is uh, 1930, good, good while before things got you know, supremely worse in Poland, especially with the death of Pilsudski in 35. And then of course, it's a prairie story. So uh, something David said yesterday really cues the way that I've been thinking about it. That is of a European man who comes to the prairies uh, at the very tail end of the settling of the West. And of course, I have no idea if he had any comprehension of that, that phenomenon and his part in it. Uh, and I don't really speculate on that. Um, and immigration then is at the heart of what I'm working on. And from there comes the timely narrative. That is, uh, in what way does the Canadian mainstream recognize the people who are allowed to come and also the people who uh, are told not to come. It, it, it works in, in both cases. And as I worked on archival and, and letters and uh, government documents, that gulf between the, 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 rec the lack of recognition between the two uh, groups uh, always stayed center field. So I'm just gonna risk it and show you two quick images and then uh, I'll, th I'll throw them away so that you, we see each other. Um, hang on. So what could be more official? Uh, the, the postage stamp from 1930 of what could be Southern Saskatchewan, but then more importantly, uh, this image. Um, so one of the great artifacts that I've found as I've been working on this, um, is this uh, photograph that was kept in the Glenbow archive, still, still there, of the Calgary Parrot School Mandolin Orchestra circa 1929. And in the chapter in David's book, I use it to uh, contrast with what the CNR was up to at this very year and in years prior and post. That is running very uh, complicated and, and impressive folk festivals out west. Uh, and these took place in the big cities, but they also took place in uh, Banff. And they were focused on folk culture, that is ethnic culture, but also indigenous handicrafts, music and dance. So it was, it was a real kind of proto-multicultural project. And the group that wasn't there at any time uh, were Jews, except for in the Hard House Quartet where you had uh, Jewish players, uh, but they were, do they were doing their own uh, special thing on that front. So um, these people, uh, my, my parrot Schuller mandolin orchestra lived in the shadow of the Palliser, where in 1930, one of these folk festivals took place. Um, and in that way, they were a sort of a natural. Uh, and from this photograph, I get the impression raring to go. Um, but the absence of anyone like the Parrot School Orchestra at the festival, when Jews were a major ethnic community in the country and the government was hard at work keeping further numbers out, to me signals exactly the thing that Jesse's looking for, this dance of mystery and misapprehension. And now I'll stop sharing. That worked? Yeah, worked well. <laughs> um, all right, so I have a second question for you. And yes. um, for anyone unaware, I know I know Norm very well, so this is uh, more almost a personal question. Uh, knowing knowing uh, the work that you do, so I want to know how does your background in literature inform this particular project? Because it seems to me that this is slightly different than your typical academic work. Uh, would you agree or disagree with that statement? Uh, it is, although it's a vein in which I I would like to go more and more. Um, but it, I would say that this project and the, the piece in, in David's book is um, motivated by my writerly goals, but also by personal memoiristic goals. So you're right, these are in some ways contradictory or they run in contrast to academic goals. But I've been using these kinds of family stories for many years. And I look back at the date of my first published short story, which was 1986, and that focused on an anecdote of my mom's from the, the Saskatchewan 30s. So uh, I, I guess I found these in some ways inescapable, and then Poland to some degree too. Uh, 
So um, the, the one uh, suitably academic pro part of this project is this work I've done in Jewish archives and also at the National Archives in Ottawa. And that was in fact the first time I've ever done any sustained archival work in my life. Um, and though I've turned it in this much more sort of personal and memoristic direction and entirely limited my scope and my focus um, to the, uh, the, the narrative as it follows from my, from my own uh, personal and intimate connection with the history. So the effect of that, and you're, you're, you're right, it, that, Im that impacts the scope and the focus and it impacts the voice. So I'm perfectly happy to make use of a, a, an engaged and personal voice in this work. Great, thank you. Um, we're gonna turn to Lois now. Um, Lois, my question's for you. My first question, um, how has your background as a Montrealer informed your study of Port Jews and Trieste and how has your study of Trieste informed your understanding of Canada? Okay, yeah, thanks. Hi, everybody. Um, you're wondering why you're gonna hear about the great Habsburg port city of Trieste in the very Northeastern corner of Italy on what used to be the Yugoslavian border, uh, why you're gonna hear about that today. So bear with me for a second while I get us on the trajectory. Um, the subtitle of, of my essay is Confessions of a Canadian-American European Jewish Historian, um, which you, Jesse, thought was quite a mouthful, and indeed it is. I grew up, so first I'll say a word about my upbringing in Montreal and then something about Trieste, and then I'll link them. Uh, so I grew up, in, um, obviously, as an English-speaking Ashkenazic Jew in Montreal in the 50s, 60s, and early 70s. And I graduated from McGill in 1974, uh, spent a year in Jerusalem, and since 1975, I've lived in Massachusetts. Um, my, um, my, my formal training in Jewish history uh, has all been in the United States. And like many uh, dual nationals, I reflect quite a bit about the differences between Canada and the US. I found my way to, and the answers change every few years, you know, as perspective changes. So I, um, I found, I knew I was interested in your modern, we didn't have the term early modern then, David, we just called it all modern, but you're right. <laughs> anyway, I wanted to study uh, issues in, Euro in modern European Jewish history, um, primarily 18th and 19th century of Jews, um, you know, becoming in, to one degree or another, more involved with the societies and the cultures around them. And I found my way um, to the study of Italy, many reasons for that, who doesn't like to study Italy and speak Italian. And uh, somehow I found my, my way to the great port city of Trieste, which was really, uh, it was built by the, the, um, the monarchy starting in the early 18th century to be a major uh, port of international trade. And it held that place until World War I, until the demise of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Now, what made it, in, it was interesting for many reasons. I don't have time to go into them. Um, but it's important to know that it was on the fault line of Germanic Central Europe, right? And Mediterranean Italian. So in the 18th century, there were two languages. There was German and there was Italian. In the 19th century, um, the, Slav, the Slavic presence became much more important, what we would call the Slovenian. Anyway, I worked on this subject for many years, and then suddenly it hit me. The fact that I came from Montreal, where I had grown up, where in the 60s and the early 70s, it was a very fraught place. It was, all we talked about was identity, identity in national terms, ethnic terms, religious terms, political terms, cultural terms, always trying to figure out what meant what, right? And all the time I was very aware that I was part of a minority um, and um, you know, the Jewish minority and then there was the English speaking minority and then there was you know, the French Canadians then called Quebecois who were a minority within Canada and Canada vis-a-vis -vis the US, it's like a Russian, you know, those dolls. So anyway, what did strike me from the beginning of my studies 
in graduate school was that somehow European Jewish history seemed much closer to me than American Jewish life. The volunteerism, the, the individualism, the separation of church and state, the non-sectarian public schools, the apparently self-confident sense of belonging of American Jews, like none of that fit Jews in Montreal. But we had a very rich, dense life, which um, I don't have time to go into. But this city of different communities with well-forged identities, side by side, jostling with various kinds of relations, right? And obviously there were the English, there were the French, the Protestants, the Catholics, the Jews, the Greeks, the Chinese, the Portuguese, and so on and so forth. So there I was studying Trieste for all kinds of reasons. And suddenly, suddenly it dawned on me that the reason um, that I began to study that place or why I felt I could understand it as a historian was that it had these, these very well-defined communities of, not just the linguistic ones I mentioned before, but there was a Jewish community, there was a Greek community, there was an Armenian community. And somehow, and the fact that in the 18th century it was kind of cosmopolitan, and then in the 19th century, late 19th century on very, very um, bitter nationalist conflicts that arose um, and came to the head much later in the 20th century. So when you think, I suddenly realized, hey, that seemed kind of familiar to me. You know, I didn't want to deal with all the issues of identity in Quebec anymore. It was just too complicated for me, right? But here I was dealing with them there. Anyway, so that's one thing. Now you asked me to reflect, um, what did I learn by looking at the Habsburg monarchy in Trieste? Did that teach me anything about Canada? And in an interesting way, um, I think it has. And I'll, I'll say these two things very quickly. One is I realized as I studied the modernizing, secularizing, so let's, for convenience, say secularizing um, revolution from above of Joseph II um, in the 1780s, I said, ah, I recognize this. This is what the so-called quiet revolution was about. This is some of what Jean Lesage and the liberals were trying to accomplish in the early 60s. So that struck me as a very interesting comparison. I've never written about it. I'm just saying that it gave me that perspective. And the other is, um, you know, all these issues of identity, they're very, very, very complex. And I think looking at Trieste also made me realize um, not every, something about language and identity tied to language. Italo Svevo, the great writer, um, his father, who was a businessman, said in Trieste, you have to know four languages. So he meant not only the binary, right, of German and Italian, but also he meant English and French, actually, for commercial purposes. And that made me realize when I was growing up, you know, the issues were so stark in Quebec. You know, are you speaking English or French? And the truth is I spoke both, but that didn't seem to be the issue at a certain point. And once I heard Marsha Rosenblatt at the Association for Jewish Studies, she's a very great, she's a very good Habsburg historian. And she said that she was analyzing Habsburg Jewish identity in World War I. And I recognized something. She said, politically, they were Habsburg. And I thought, ah, politically, Federalist, Canadian. Culturally, they were German speakers. Ah, culturally, I spoke English. And she said, ethnically, they were Jewish. And I thought, oh, yes, ethnically and religiously, I was Jewish. And suddenly, that made sense of my Montreal Canadian Jewish identity in a way that all the, the, the um, the public discourse in Montreal and Quebec had not really made sense of who I was as a Montreal Jew. I apologize if I went on too long. No, no, no that, that was great, thank you. <laughs> um, so my second question for you, so this is actually something uh, for people who were here yesterday, this is something that we've been kind of tiptoeing around uh, this discussion. So my, my second question for you, uh, in your chapter you say, quote, although the ties binding the Jews of Canada and the United States are close and tight, and the comparison of the two juries is inevitable, I maintain that the Canada-US binary lens is not sufficient. Can you explain for the audience, as succinctly as you can, uh, <laughs> <laughs> why that lens is not sufficient? Okay, I'll, I'll, be, real, I'll be much more succinct on this one. No, um, no, I, I already didn't mean like that. <laughs> what? I, I meant this is a big question. I didn't mean that you went too long. <laughs> it, they're all big questions, yeah. Um, I would just say this, the, 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 the comparison with the US is so obvious. We don't, we don't have to explore it at all. But some of the other dimensions that I think we ought to pay attention to, 
if we're looking, David, in the early modern period, all the, um, you know, all the Jewries of all the Americas were, you know, they were port Jews and they were part of these overseas European empires. So we might as well look at what was going on in British North America with what was French and even and Spanish, et cetera, right? In the, in the colonial period and in, um, you know, early independent countries. Um, I would say, I think, you know, we think Montreal and we think New York, or we think Montreal and Toronto, and Montreal and Toronto and New York. We should also think of Mexico City. We should also think of Buenos Aires, because if we're fast forwarding to the late 19th century and 20th century, the mass migration of Eastern European Jews, those became very important centers too. And why don't we compare those cities? Or if we're looking at the migration after World War II, a lot of Jews went to other places besides New York and the US. So that's, that's one kind of comparison. I think for some of the reasons I already indicated, um, you know, Canadian, Canada is in between the US and Britain and Europe in a certain sense. And that's true of the Jewish communities too. So we should compare Canadian Jews to experiences in Britain and the European continent and not only to the US. And then um, I would say there's two large diasporas. There's an Anglophone diaspora, you know, if you think British Empire, Commonwealth, and so on. And there's a Francophone diaspora. And the Jews of, of Canada are part of both. So we should be looking at those very wide frames of reference. So those are just some examples um, of what I think could be fruitful to pursue. Great, thank you. Uh, so we'll move on to uh, Pierre Antil now. Uh, my first question for Pierre, um, you've said that a quote, serious disconnect exists between Francophone and Anglophone practitioners of Canadian Jewish history. Can you elaborate on that briefly? And can you see a solution to it? Oh, you gotta, you have to unmute. I never get used to it, okay. So Canadian Jewish history is part of the, uh, fundamentally of the Canadian canon with unique ramification in world Jewish history. So it, it attracted going uh, historians and observers that are non-Jewish and certainly cannot write personal approaches to Jewish history like people have done in this book. I am one of them. Uh, there are many reasons for this. Um, anti-Jewish prejudice or encounter, if you take the positive side, has to be explored on both sides. That hasn't been done very much. Mostly Canadian Jewish history has studied the approach uh, of those who experience prejudice. But what about those who expressed a position or a perception of Jews? Why, how, and from what origins? Um, in Montreal specifically, as Lois has said, um, we've come to the realization we cannot do a reasonable history of the city uh, without taking account Montreal Jewish history. It just can't be done anymore. And this is something that we've realized in the last 20 years. It's 6% of the population of Montreal. In certain areas, 50% or more there are two municipalities with 80% or more on the island of Montreal. It's the largest immigrant community between 1900 and 1950 in Montreal. So it has to count for something important. And Yiddish, we realize, us, the Goyim, is the third most used language after French and English for 50 years in Montreal. Um, we have found reverse testimonials. In other words, how were Jews perceived by the Goim? There are many positive and many negative um, that have not been fully explored by Jews and that uh, need to be factored into this complex history. Uh, for one thing, a compelling element is that the Jews were the first non-Christians to become integrated into Montreal history. And this is decisive. It has produced a very, very deep reaction. How can the French and English Canadians accept non-Christians? Where will they study? 
How will they be accepted? How will they figure in the general economy of this uh, city? Um, what opened the gates for Francophones specifically were three factors that are deep factors. The Quiet Revolution removed the notion that only French Canadians could be Quebecois. And so Jews could be Quebecois. And that was something entirely new that emerged in the 1980s. Not only Jews, Haitians, uh, Blacks, Greeks, and so forth. The second element was Nostra Etate, the pronouncement by the Vatican Council of the 60s, which turned the tables completely on how Catholics perceived Jews. And that had, had an enormous impact on how historians of Quebec perceive Jews. And finally, some of the non-Jews, some of the Goyim began to learn Jewish languages, such as Yiddish. And they could read Jewish history from the Jewish point of view, which was not possible before. Um, we've discovered, I don't know if this is shared by everyone outside of uh, the Goyim, uh, it's a major finding, I think, from the sources that we've been able to collect in French, mostly, uh, that the relationship between Jews and French Canadians is not entirely negative, as has been often portrayed. It's an encounter between two minorities that both feel vulnerable and need to relate to the other with precautions and a defensive position. Unlike the reaction or the relationship of Jews to the British Anglo-British majority, uh, that has transformed the field as far as we're concerned. Um, we've reached many more advances and conclusions based on solid evidence found in the French language and written in French, which have not reached, unfortunately, very much yet the larger Canadian uh, Jewish historical world. Um, and has tended to perpetuate certain uh, notions, some of them prejudice, uh, on the base of people who uh, write in English mostly. So we have not found an equilibrium in the sense that what is written in French is not necessarily read or understood or merges with what is being produced on the other side of the linguistic border. Um, the, um, the conclusion I come to is, um, um, I've no difficulty accepting that some forms of research uh, are significant mostly to readers, to researchers of Jewish origins, such as community history, Jewish rituals, family genealogy, aspects of the Holocaust, as in this book, it's perfectly legitimate. But the intersection of Canadian Jewish history and mainstream Canadian Jewish history has to be more productive if individuals of different origins and sensitivity meet and share data and come to broader conclusions together. We haven't done this yet. And it's, it's one of the problems of the field is it's going in two directions. It's going in one direction in English and then now in another direction in French. And, and this means that increasingly uh, we have authors uh, that uh, must come to terms and researchers and readers with both official languages. And they will be also a very different background, uh, which was not the case before. And I think there's no escaping this. Thank you. So my, my second question kind of has to do with, uh, with, with what you just mentioned. Um, you note that Francophone work on Canadian Jewish history is typically done by non-Jews, while the opposite is true for Anglophone work. So my question is, do you think non-Jews are at a disadvantage in studying Canadian Jewish history? So I'm going to phrase it differently than you did. Go for it. OK. Most non-Jews or goyim, the very important distinction, uh, active in Canadian Jewish history are Francophones. See, it's not phrased the same way. Uh, uh, because of a strong, I would argue, mutual attraction between the two groups, which is both positive and negative. Uh, th there are Francophone Jews active in the field and mostly Sephardim. It, it's a different approach for them altogether. And I'm not going to enter into that. Most non-Jews who translate Yiddish work in the French language and produce French language translations. They created 
a new school of translations with repercussions in the French speaking public, which is also very new. Um, also, uh, another mechanism is that French Canadian anti Semitism is one of the central issues of debates in Canadian Jewish history, whether we like it or not. It's occupied a lot of energies. Uh, this has tended to challenge us, Francophone historians, to better document the phenomena from our own point of view, from French sources, uh, uh, and especially in the French press in the 20th century and in the sphere of ideology, something which was not done seriously in the English language up to now. Uh, we have now a complete analysis of the editorials published in Le Devoir, from 1910 to 1947. We have a very, uh, it's about to be published, a very serious study of the newspaper, L'Action Catholique, published in Quebec City. Over 700 documents from the 30s. Diocesan archives have been approached and have been studied. Not, not satisfactory, sat in great satisfaction yet, but uh, much more. Catholic history, the origins of much of the anti-Semitism of the French Canadians has also been studies in Vatican pronouncements. We understand better now what that means. And I published a full history of Jews in Quebec over four centuries, which will appear in, Fra in, Fra in English translation soon. So all of this is changing the face of the field. Are we better equipped or not is what you're asking me. Jesse, are we at a disadvantage? I will let you judge, but I will say this much. Most Francophone going who enter the field are fluently bilingual. They can work, they can write, and they can read in both official languages, which is not the case with people on the other side, always at least. Um, we perceive Yiddish very differently as well. For us, Yiddish is not a disappearing language or language infused with suffering. It's a tool we use to better understand the early Montreal Canadian Jewish history at the beginning of the 20th century. And we used it uh, in a literary sense. Um, we can see the field, and I will join with Lois, uh, as a field that requires multiple linguistic skills, at least four, English, French, Yiddish, and Hebrew. And that's how Francophones have approached it. We think it's fundamental. Um, without a mastery of the French language, you cannot go to the bottom of French Canadian anti Semitism, hostility, or mutual relationships with Jews. Secondary sources will not do in this case, or no sources at all. It's very fundamental in the methodology of history. You need the historical sources. And if they're in French, you need them in French. Um, this is something you might want to discuss. We're free, of course, of anti-Francophone sentiments. That makes sense, right? Um, it's not always the case in what is produced in English in Canadian Jewish history. And I think personally, it's a transfer from Anglo-British perceptions of French Canada. We are gonna have to look at this more closely because it's an obstacle. Uh, it's true, Jews cannot refer to lived Jewish experiences such as in this book, because we're at a distance. But Francophones can open their minds to Jewish testimonials and absorb the significance historically and contribute to give Canadian Jewish history its full force. Thank you, Jesse, thank you all. Thank you, that's a really interesting perspective. Um, my next question is for David as the editor, but it's sort of an open question as well. Um, I see in Lois and Mia and Norm's chapters a very personal touch. Uh, these are academic discussions, yes, but they're framed within stories of family and self, something that I personally find really enticing about the book. Um, was this something that you set out to do when you conceived of the topic, or did it just come about that way? Uh, I'll have a stab first. Yes. Well, I'm glad. I'm glad that you uh, that that's enticing about it, the book for you. Um, you know, having Borderlands kind of personal professional essays was certainly not in the original design. 
uh, when I began reaching out to potential contributors, but it very soon became clear that if I wanted to include folks outside the outside of the field, uh, that this perspective would have to be not only invited, but totally welcome. And so Lois, you, you, you and I had many conversations. We were like, ah, I don't know if I can contribute to this. I don't work on Canadian Jews. And so the, this was a kind of uh, early on discussion. Uh, as it happened, the, the editor of UTP who I was working with, Len Husband, really liked this feature of the book as well. Uh, and so we decided that it could be slated as one of their crossover books in UTP's Insights series. So that made it also a kind of a welcome published home. And I don't know, I mean, I think the results are very interesting and are, are profound. Uh, you know, so much of what's preoccupied my scholarship has to do with fuzzy sense of belonging, of home and identity. Um, and uh, I don't think you can study these kinds of categories or what these things mean without an attunement to affect. Uh, you can do affect about, you know, the way that Pierre's talking about them, about, you know, the, the feelings of about others uh, without having same kind of personal connections as Norm has and the work that he writes or some of the other contributors have had, Lois or other, other people as well. Um, but I, I'm just fascinated by this uh, sort of puzzle of the individual, or really of psychology for historians. What do historians do with psychology? And I've long been interested in poking around the edges of this problem. Um, I teach, for example, a, a, a seminar, a fourth year seminar called the History of Me. And it's a, a genealogy seminar that begins with the students' intimate family stories. They're the, the, the lore of their childhoods about some part of their family history, what choices or limits or social psychologies were engendered in their grandparents or great grandparents or parents based on the historical constraints uh, that they lived with. And then ask the students not only to work through with primary sources, their family history, but to sort of turn to connect those intimate families, family and personal um, uh, elements of history to the wider kinds of analytic, you know, aggregate work that professional historians do. Uh, and fortunately this book worked out uh, as an opportunity to mix some of these academic and I wouldn't call them non-academic, but kind of intimate academic uh, voices as well. And I think that's perfectly fitting for a, a book that meditates on the idea of home. Jesse, I have a thought. I mean, one maybe one of the things that David also allowed was a sort of a cross, he, he's saying it without saying it, cross-disciplinary approach. So I'm not sure, I haven't done the count, but maybe the core uh, number of writers are historians, but then some of the more whatever peculiar or uh, different approaches, I don't know if, it, if that would round out, come from different disciplines. So by no means am I a historian, but in my case, the historical content um, has always been notably absent to my mind, that the, the thing that I needed to tell comes from a territory and from a particular moment and a certain type of personality that uh, reminds me of something Richard sometimes says, you know, isn't in the archives. So uh, maybe sometimes the other disciplines somehow have the lever or they have the peculiar ear or whatever it is to uh, sort of uh, reverse course or, or, or shift the focus. Um, I'm not a historian, I, I'm, I'm a literature and cultural studies person, but I think it was also um, for, for some of us, because I don't usually work on, on Canadian literature, uh, it, it was a point of entry and, and it's, it, it was interesting because I felt uncomfortable placing myself um, into the work, you know, when I, when I had worked on the memoirs of the Azraeli Foundation. Uh, I was doing my PhD at York University and was a way that I, I was able to help fund <laughs> my studies um, and, and taking a fresh look at, at those works from a literary point of view. I needed some of that distance um, and, and that's very difficult balance when you're putting yourself um, you know, to have that distance when you're putting yourself into the academic work, but, but it was freeing as well. It was, it was nice to experiment with that in some ways to, 
I mean, I work on migration and of course I've, I've migrated, you know, to, to four different countries in, in the past, um, in the past 20 years. But um, so there is that way I, that of course I connect to it, but, um, but being Canadian and in Jewish studies and then somehow turning that into Canadian Jewish studies was, uh, and still retaining academic integrity and objectivity was, was a challenge I found that, that I really, you know, tried to, to sort of, okay, I'll just do this in the first few paragraphs and then I'll, I'll, I'll get back to my academic self. Go for it, Liz. Well, I know that, you know, David and I did have many conversations at the beginning, and I don't usually write about myself in my historical work, so I knew this would be an interesting experiment, but um, the Yeshiva University Museum in New York held a panel about a few years before this of Canadian Jews um, talking, well, Montreal Jews <laughs> talking about their upbringing, and it was, it was really, really fascinating. The room was packed. So that kind of whet my appetite to want to think about this some more. And I'm also aware, you know, I'm in a very small, I'm in a relatively small Jewish studies program at Smith College. And how many of the people do you think are Canadian in origin? Actually, most of us are Jewish, but one person is not. I mean, there's a preponderance of Canadians. And there are a lot of Canadians in the field of academic Jewish studies uh, in the US writ large. So I think. That's interesting in and of itself. You know, what are the, the matrices of identity and upbringing and sense of belonging, of being a minority, all of this that has led so many Canadian Jews into Jewish studies. So it was a way of thinking through some of that too, but of course focused on myself and my studies. Very interesting. Um, Pierre, you, I, I did not notice an autobiographical nature to yours, but if you would like to comment on this question, Okay, um, so I, I, I'm going to do a, a quick lightning round here uh, because I think we'll have a few minutes to bring on some of the other contributors uh, just to feature them uh, who are in the audience right now. Um, so my question, and I'll go according to who's on my screen, so we'll go Norm, Mia, David, Pierre, Lois. Um, can you each point me to one chapter in the book by authors who are not one of you five uh, that you found particularly interesting? So I will quickly highlight Richard Menkes's chapter, which has its, his usual succinct rigor uh, and focuses on three uh, museum exhibitions over the course of a number of decades, the most recent being at the Pier 21 Museum. Um, and there he looks at something a little like what we've talked about today, that is the relationship between Jewish researchers, curators, and audiences and mainstream institutions, whether it's a museum or a university department. And then he makes the ephemeral uh, promotion proposition at the end that we should have a museum of Canadian experiences. So he, he leaves it at that and then lets us start to imagine what that thing might be. So it's the, the paper is a, a neat historical rendering of development of that a museum audience curator relationship and then the proposition for the future. Mia, go ahead. I'm, I'm gonna break the rules by, <laughs> by first of all, naming two and also naming one person who's on this panel, but I felt that um, the way that this book was book was book ended, um, with, uh, with Morton Weinfeld and Pierre Antil's essays was really, you know, one of my favorite parts of the book as well, just because I feel like, you know, as a lot of these took a little piece of um, Canadian history or personal history or reflections or, or even for me, for example, you know, the, the literature that's full of allusions and nuances and perspectives and both of these you know, took a step out uh, as a reality check um, of, of what the evidence was and, and what the field was in a, in a very larger perspective. And I felt that was my favorite part of the book was just the way it, it began and ended those, those two essays. Great, thank you, David. Um, 
I'm going to highlight two as well. So I, I thought Jeff, I think Jeff Feilinger's essay on Ukrainians and Jews uh, and their involvement with the uh, sort of intellectual ground for multiculturalism was really bold and provocative and uh, and very original. Uh, and I also, I loved Hesh Troper's essay on uh, the election of Nathan Phillips of Toronto's first uh, Jewish mayor. And it actually has sort of inspired a potential larger project for me about um, the history of Jewish mayors in Canada, possibly something slightly more global. There have been about 50 Jewish, Jewish mayors in small towns and large cities from the 19th through the 20th century uh, in Quebec and in, in every province, actually, even in the territory or two, uh, conservatives, left-wingers. And I find it just fascinating to sort of think about uh, this threshold of power where being Jewish does not seem to limit one's access to political authority. So as a kind of sample study and an inspiration for, I think, a, a really interesting global topic about Jews in power and, and cities, um, I, I, I'm grateful to Hesh for that. And I also just quickly want to plug that I have an essay in the book as well, which tries to make a kind of wide angle case for thinking about Canadian Jewish history uh, through the lens of Jewish indigenous relations and tries to think what, what, what does it look like if we think about if we if we tra if we re translate immigration as settlement as colonial part of a settler colonial process instead of just an immigration and internal experience if it's more dialogical and um, yeah it's in there too. Pierre. I enjoyed uh, Mort's very much. I think we need that kind of perspective, a uh, broader perspective beyond the only Canadian Jewish. And I enjoyed also since um, me and Neil too, I enjoyed uh, also um, Carmen Weiser on Montreal. Thank you, Lois. Some of the ones I was considering mentioning have already been mentioned. So um, I will mention Yolan Cohen's art, uh, chapter forgetting and forging my Canadian experience as a Moroccan Jew. So she takes us from um, uh, Morocco to Paris to Montreal and um, her, um, uh, you know, her experience as, 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 as a sojourner, as an immigrant, it's, it's very, she does it very, very well um, in discussing the objective circumstances and her own uh, you know, subjective responses. And identity. It's a very unique voice in the volume, and I think it's well done. Um, I also like Jeff Weidinger's. I thought that the uh, the Ukrainian perspective was very important as a comparative one. And um, yeah, I think that's great. Thank you. Um, so the last thing I want to do, we have uh, about seven minutes left. Um, there are other contributors from this volume in the audience. I'd like to bring them on the screen just to feature them if they're willing. Um, so we have Ira Robinson, Richard Menkes, uh, Mort Weinfeld, and Ruth Panofsky. And I know uh, Mort Weinfeld mentioned to me that he had uh, a couple of uh, comments. Uh, so if, if he feels comfortable speaking uh, for a couple minutes or starting a discussion. And then once our time is up, um, we'll have breakout sessions a breakout session where the conversation can continue while we set up for the next session. So go ahead, Mark. Hold on, you gotta unmute. Okay, can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much, Jesse. I, I, I was just curious if there would be a kind of a Q&A thing. So I'll be very brief. Uh, in my contribution to the book, you know, the, the question of the title is no better home question mark. So what I did is I tried to answer the question. And the answer that I came up with, grosso modo, was yes. <laughs> that right now, today, on the sets of measures that I had, uh, Jews in Canada were a very privileged and lucky group. And I tried to give the, the, the evidence for that. I even went a step further and I said, you know what, it's not that the Jews who are lucky, but even other minorities in, you know, Canada, the United States, England and France, I compared them and they're also probably on balance better off. And I looked at two types of measures. One is 
integration. How well are they integrated into the spaces of their surrounding society? Economic, political, what have you, right? And the other was Jewish identity retention, the vibrancy of Jewish culture. What are the elements of, of Jewish culture, you know, languages, the, the usual suspects? I trotted them out, I looked at them, and I thought Jews in Canada, on balance, were doing very well. My students hate when I say this stuff because it, you know the, the current zeitgeist is to just find fault with every society as much as possible. And there's lots that Canada can be faulted for. Okay, so what I wanna end with, so let, let's assume I'm right in some crazy way with these measures. But I have two other questions that, that sort of I didn't really answer. One is, if that's true, why exactly is that true? What is the reason for those advantages? And there's a big debate in the field on what the various reasons can be for those Canadian advantages. So that's the first question. And the second one is a little more provocative, but I, I, I'm sort of caught up in the current moment, i.e. the past two weeks, which we've all been spending uh, watching and, and reading about events in the Middle East. And so that, so the next question I have, and David, this can be volume two in this series if you want, is so what? So what? If, 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 you know, if Canadian Jews seem to be better off in a variety of ways in an increasingly globalized world where even things like anti-Semitism have these clear globalized dimensions, right? It, it's not just, you know, the history of anti-Semitism in Canada, like social credit or what have you, but there are global forces at work. Are we coming to some sort of inflection point on that issue? I hope we are not. But if we are, how does Canada fit in to this new reality? That may be a little bit of a somber note to inject, but what the hell? Um, but, uh, you know, I could have spoken at great length about personal things. My father was a Holocaust survivor. He integrated well into Canada, and this was his way of integrating primarily into Canada. He became a tremendous fan of the Montreal Canadiens, as am I. So I'll end on that later note. Thanks a lot, Jess. Thank you, Marth. That was great. Um, I think what we might do now, just because this was a bit improvised, um, I think I'm gonna close out this session by thanking David, Mia, Norm, Lois, and Pierre. Um, this has been great. I'm, I'm so happy that we got to do this. Uh,